going. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. My name is Dalia, and I work as a community manager here at Kong, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to our tech talk today. We have two of our Kong champions presenting. I will let them introduce themselves. Um, the topic for today will be to discuss design and best practices for building a cloud agnostic API platform. So please note all of your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, I would like to pass it to Sid and Rago. Go ahead. Hey, Dalia, thank you. Um, once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Siddharth here. Um, um, I'm a, a, I'm a cloud security engineer. Um, I've ha I have close to 12 years of experience. Uh, um, primarily working on building platforms and then security platforms specifically right now. I uh, have experience with uh, a lot of experience with Kong um, and some experience with Kafka, Kubernetes, and so on. So thank you for joining in. And Raghu, do you want to quickly give a sure. introduction? So morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Myself, Raghu. I'm a lead software engineer and I have more than uh, 15 years of experience. and. Uh, I primarily work on um, API management platforms. Uh, Kong is one of them. Um, yeah, I work on Kubernetes, Kafka as well. So yeah, thanks for joining in. All right. Uh, so let's let's begin. So today we would like to uh, quickly go over some of the best practices and the design. Uh, I mean, uh, addition that we had taken up to build a cloud agnostic API platform. Uh, so let's move on quickly. The first question, uh, let's let's see what what is the uh, first question is like what why do we even need a cloud agnostic platform? What are the key drivers or business requirements? Right. Um, so uh, uh, the first one, like we know that uh, the word microservices. I mean, it's been ringing a bell for some time now. It's become old enough. However, still there are a lot of companies, uh, big companies, which are trying to move out of that entire. Uh, the paradigm of a monolith to microservices. So with that being said, the APIs are key. Um, so your API strategy is key for a company's success. And uh, that's why API management comes into picture. So um, yeah, this microservice is one important reason. And uh, as you know, COVID um, that, that happened, it was a reality check on all of us and businesses too. Uh, one thing COVID did was it stressed the importance of the phrase of time to market. Uh, business had to quickly adapt uh, with and come up with faster and innovative solutions for problems. And the main important part of it is they had to come up, uh, come with up, come with it immediately, right? So those organizations that did not accumulate agility uh, had a big impact. So that is where I believe API management plays a key role as well. And um, move on like the uh, cloud hybrid approach. I mean, so most of the organizations right now are moving toward a uh, hybrid cloud. Uh, uh, set up. This is primarily, it has its own benefits for better control of data. Uh, choose You can choose where to house your specific data, and it also reduces the risk of exposure of data. And this centralized management plane, uh, uh, it kind of helps in implementing your uh, standards and governance better. So that is where this cloud agnostic word comes into picture. So that is one of the key drivers. And of course, um, API monetization. Gone are day, those days where uh, APIs or web services are just a medium of communication between two companies or two systems. So right now, APIs are a keyword or a buzzword where it can be used uh, to, uh, I mean, like based on your model, you can use to, uh, it would be a major ma revenue stream. Uh, you can use like subscription models or pay as you use. I mean, it depends uh, how you use. At this point of time, API management helps streamline that process and helps you come to profitability, right? So that is also an important business requirement. Uh, and uh, finally, like I go with uh, developer experience and consumer management. Um, as your APIs evolve and, and there is more adoption uh, to your APIs, consumer management becomes a real headache. You need to have the right controls and telemetry in place uh, to have uh, to to manage this. Um, if if you want to increase your customer base, uh, the developer experience is important. When I mean a developer experience, it is the overall perception or emotion of a developer while he's interacting with your API. Uh, the ease of which he is doing that, right? That that is really important. So it encompasses your infrastructure tools, any touch points with your with your customer or uh, the consumer. 
uh, is important. So that is where API management and the API portal comes into picture. I believe these are like one of the key drivers to have a cloud agnostic uh, API gateway, right? Now, those are business requirements, I'd say. Now, yeah, you uh, we did talk about the intangible uh, details, like let's go into something that is tangible. This is based on my past experience. Um, there might be companies who who would kind of move uh, from a, a monolith or a architecture to a transcending to a microservice architecture, right? Assuming that premise, um, you probably would have close to 300 to 500 APIs and uh, you might be in different network zones considering you uh, going to cloud and hybrid cloud and uh, the you might have a gateway in one of the region, not have a gateway in other regions. So there will not be parity across platforms. And typically, based on your um, whether you're on retail and other, I mean, depends. You might have 3K TPS um, out of the baseline. But um, once you move to microservices, the new approach. Uh, I mean, we probably would see that uh, because of the microservice architecture, the number of APIs would dramatically increase, like say, thousand to five, two thousand APIs. Uh, you would require that feature parity across bo across the board, right? I mean, like for example, the same kind of security mechanism that you have and then for the governance mechanisms and the threat protection and so on, you would meet that, right? So that is something to keep in mind. And then uh, probably you'll be around 12K or 13K, depending upon your APIs, because if you have more APIs, the traffic is going to increase. So all of these kind of uh, ends up in only one thing. You have more APIs and you need to manage these APIs. So that is the reality. Right? Now, so moving on. So we did go through the uh, the business requirements. Uh, now let's go into the uh, technical requirements. Suppose I need a platform, what are the features of the platform? Right? Uh, cloud nativity. I mean, this term we often um, learn this. Um, it is more about building an application, building and running an application to that takes advantage of the distributed computing model that cloud provides you. Like native, uh, all the native apps uh, are designed to exploit scalability, elasticity, resiliency, flexibility, and what, and all the good features of cloud. So your application should be able to, should be designed in such a way that it's able to exploit that. And uh, yeah, uh, the other feature that I would expect in my uh, gateway is high availability and scalability, um, and I would say even elasticity. Um, so scalability is the ability of your application to handle sudden spike or increase in traffic. This can happen because maybe one node is down, one of the regions is down. This can happen because there is sudden influx of the traffic. This can happen because it's Thanksgiving or there is sudden uh, increase in you buying stock or whatever. I mean, that could be any reason. So your system, without compromise on performance, it should be able to take care of uh, that influx of traffic. And from scalability perspective, I would say, um, I mean, from an availability perspective, I would say it, it has to be uh, up and running without interruption. Uh, and work seamlessly as intended. Um, few things to keep in mind, it shouldn't be a single point of failure. Uh, first of all, you need to know, I mean, th th there should be failure de de detection mechanism and you should have reliable crossover. That is also something that I would say. And elasticity, I would say, is uh, based on your you resource, uh, based on your available, uh, the resource usage should be based on your input parameters. I mean, whether it's, if you have more traffic, you should be able to scale up and scale down if it is less traffic. That is also something that to keep in mind. And uh, now coming to uh, extensible architecture is something that I would expect because, I mean, extensible architecture is like a software pack, uh, design pattern where, where you design uh, uh, software in a modularized and a uh, I mean, uh, way uh, such that you can expand the functionalities and add additional capabilities without compromising or modifying the core functionality of that product. Um, so it is more of a structured and modularized programming. Um, uh, I mean, standard and uh, basically you can have, a, uh, it helps faster time to market one of the initial business requirements. Um, you can, you can the plugin or the plugin code can be isolated and troubleshooted without compromising the main part. So these are few features of an extensible architecture. Apart, I mean, apart from all of these three, I mean, I would say one of the key components is the observability, monitoring, and uh, telemetry. Um, monitoring tells you when something is wrong. Observability tells you what is happening to your system when something goes wrong, right? So um, observability kind of, uh, you know the internal state of a complex system uh, with any changes that comes from outside. It tells you the root cause, 
of any issue without any additional testing or coding. And the monitoring again, I would say is uh, knowing the state of your system or your health of your system with predefined KPIs. So that is also something that I would expect in my system. And uh, 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 moving forward, then I would also say that uh, deployment automation is a key piece. Uh, uh, this is a set of reliable, repeatable, fast and automated process that uh, deploys your code in different environments. The same process should be followed from dev to production. Uh, this way, there is integrity of code and uh, the deployment process. Um, of course, it comes with testing. Uh, we know the CICD drill. It comes with testing and um, scanning and whatnot. But ideally, it's the, it's, it's the integrity of the uh, deployment process and the code. That is what we are expecting. And uh, finally, another thing that uh, we, we would expect is probably um, the next one would be open source um, uh, adoption. Um, so I would choose a product that would embrace uh, uh, open source culture uh, because you can start, um, I mean, start small and then iterate faster. Uh, it has a wide run community of flexible SDLC. Um, so that way, I, these are probably my technical requirements for a uh, gateway. So let me see what how to answer this, right? I mean, I would say um, Kong would be uh, like the uh, primary one with, because it encompasses all the features that I mentioned, like uh, cloud agnostic, um, uh, I mean, uh, cloud native, it is. Uh, uh, it has a vibrant open source uh, community, and then it also has uh, um, all the good things that I mentioned, right? It has plugins and whatnot. So uh, the, the way we would like the solution that is have Kong as the centerpiece, and then, uh, for example, use its plugin. Uh, I mean, it has a huge plugin hub uh, that Kong provides that uh, has the capabilities, and you can extend it on top of that. And uh, of course, uh, from a scalability and cloud nativity, putting Kong in Kubernetes and using Kubernetes operators is also something that uh, would help. And then uh, uh, the consumer management is creating a developer portal. It can be custom or Kong provides its own uh, portals. And uh, of course, analytics, uh, Kong provides a lot of, uh, um, like I would say, uh, open, like you, you will have capabilities to tie it up with Datadog and whatnot. So you can, the, the analytics and reporting piece is also covered. And deployment automation, um, you have capabilities where that can be automated too. So now let, let us go into detail as to into each of these uh, capabilities, right? We, we talked about scalability and cloud nativity, right? Um, so let's talk more about it. So one thing that would help is Kubernetes deployment. Right. Kubernetes is like an open source container orchestration system uh, for automating software uh, deployment uh, and then for scaling and management. Okay, With Kong, if you see, there are two uh, uh, containers that you have within one pod. Pod is probably the uh, smallest entity within Kubernetes. Um, uh, KIC is the Kong ingress controller. You can choose to have that because it manages your components, uh, your uh, configuration. And then, of course, you have a Kong proxy, which is the real runtime. Both of them are you uh, are like containers within one pod. Uh, for scalability, I mean, based on your uh, what you can do is you can have uh, HPA set up uh, horizontal pod scaling based on thresholds. That threshold can be uh, a memory or CPU. Kong is like a uh, for most part of it, Kong is memory intensive uh, because it stores a lot of it in their cache. So uh, you can set thresholds based on that. And then increase your pod count, uh, have a min and max, and set a desirable state, and then it could increase based on your incoming traffic. The other thing that you can do is you can scale vertically as well. You can also have a uh, uh, like a node scale scaling, because suppose your pod is out of, uh, you, you've reached a limit in pod, you can kind of scale your node as well. That way you have horizontal and vertical scaling. The other one that we suggest is there is an operator KEDA. Um, which kind of uh, helps you with uh, uh, like uh, you can define the metric based on which you you need to scale. Like for example, if you have a count, like uh, if you want to increase the count uh, uh, based on the incoming request, that is also something that you can do with respect to Keda. It use the cube metrics, um, so that is also something to think about. That is so we are covered with the horizontal and vertical scaling. Now uh, the other one that I would say is operator. Um, These operators are software extensions in uh, Kubernetes to manage your application and your components. 
Um, so it is it follows a, a principle of control loop, uh, like a control system. If you see something lagging, it would just uh, I mean offset based on your control system mechanism. Um, so it removes any human intervention um, using uh, by maintaining a CRD um, a custom resource. Um, for each application. Um, in Kong, I mean, you have two types of operators. You have a help-based operator and also a Go-based operator, uh, which manages it. So there is no need for a human intervention. Uh, you can also manage multiple namespaces with the operator pattern. So in that way, there is scaling and also your entire application is managed by the operator. So that way, this entire scalability and cloud nativity is kind of brought into picture. Now, moving on. Um, high availability uh, and multi-region deployment. There are a lot of cases where you would need a active active setup uh, where you, I mean Kong should be available or the API management system should be available in both the regions, right? So in those kind of situations, what we can do is you can set up a, a Kong in both the regions, uh, have a GTM and two LTMs on top of it, and then you can have a uh, you can have like a intelligent health check on Kong. That is something that you can build like a as a service. Um, and then this would tell you, give you different uh, uh, error codes uh, for, for uh, in case there are issues, you can set up different error codes and for successful ones, you can have a um, error code and your LTM can keep polling that uh, health check. Um, and uh, GTM and LTM or ALB, or depends upon the cloud that you have, uh, GLB or ALB, you can set that up where it automatically routes to a different region in case one of this thing is down, one of the Kong is down. This can be used for disaster recovery as well, where you control in which region the or which data center the call is routed to. Suppose uh, you turn off the uh, health check in one region, it moves to the other region. That is something that you can do. Um, in, in Kong, there are two, uh, two uh, moving parts. It's the databases and the Kong itself. We talked about scalability and availability with respect to Kong. Now let's go to database. Okay, There are two ways to implement that. Uh, in case of multi-region, see uh, Postgres being a single write node, uh, the way you can do is you can have a write node in one region and then have a replica within the region for availability within a region and also have a sync across the region as well. Of course, there is going to be some kind of latency for the data sync, but that can be enhanced in multiple ways. So in that way, if one region master goes down, automatically the, um, the other uh, uh, database becomes the master. And similarly, uh, there is at no point there is an uh, an issue with even the data stores. Um, th at this point of time, maybe HA proxy and Petroni scripts are certain things that will help you identify that the master has gone down and you have to move to a different master. Or everything is done automatically, but this is an architecture that kind of helps provide uh, uh, a high availability across regions, even in the database. Um, so this is one option. The other option is have two different databases uh, in different regions. Okay, um, so there is no sync across the regions. Um, uh, so in this case, there is not even a latency problem there. However, there is one thing that you need to take care of in case you use it for tokens, right? Token generation in that case, uh, you have to make sure there is the GTM or LTM you have has a good uh, um, stickiness and also it has a um, I'd say uh, region based affinity because if your initial OAuth call goes to generate token in one database and the subsequent call to verify that goes to a different database, then that is going to be a problem. So that's what I mean. You need to have proper stickiness. Um, so we can evaluate the uh, options and based on requirements, this, these are things that you can do for high availability, both respect to the Kong and the databases. Uh, yeah, um, moving on. Uh, yeah. Plugins, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, plugin architecture in Kong is really helpful. You can extend the capabilities. Uh, I would call out few uh, uh, plugin security. Of course, Kong provides a lot of security plugins. Apart from that, you can have an uh, integration with multiple IDPs like Popta and so on and so forth. And you, the, depending upon your uh, your deployment model, you need to have a upstream uh, last mile security as well. Suppose your Kong is deployed in a different cluster and your app applications or APIs are deployed in different cluster, then that connectivity, you need an upstream uh, last mile security. That is something you might want to think about. Then moving on, we uh, there are routing. This is another capability of uh, gateway where uh, dynamic routing based on uh, headers, 
uh, based on payloads, based on, and we, that is something that you can do. And then context-based routing in the payload also is something you can do or build your own plugin. Um, telemetry, uh, yeah, I mean, with respect to logging, you have uh, uh, transaction logging and verbose logging where transaction is just metadata verbose where you also log the payload. Um, so that is also something that you would look at. Kong provides its own set of plugins, but you can build uh, plugins on top of that for your custom requirements as well. Of course, even there are other plugins like uh, the error framework. Uh, if you want to have a consistent error response for your consumers, that is also something that you can look at. And then finally, data transformation. This is a debatable topic whether uh, the gateway should do the transform data transformation, but if, if your organization chooses to do that. You have different uh, data transformation logics as well that are available by default, and you can build on top of that um, plugin. These are some things that uh, um, I mean, we have gone through. So let's say these are key uh, I mean, uh, capabilities that you can do from a Kong perspective. Um, moving on, um, we talked about deployment uh, automation. So it is about reliability. Uh, repeatability and everything should happen in a click of a button, right? So there are two kinds of deployments in Kong. One is the infrastructure deployment, another one is the API deployment. Uh, both can follow a similar pattern. Uh, in case of an infrastructure deployment, basically it's about uh, the Kong images, the ingress controller images, and it's supporting components, the CPU memory of each of it. And so, and also it includes any custom plugin that you build. And um, it also can be part of the infrastructure. Uh, it's probably Lua code, so you need to deploy that as well. Um, and then APIs are actually your uh, YAML files defining services, routes, plugins, attaching to the services, and so on. Um, consumer is the name of your consumer, his credentials, and so on. So um, defining your repositories are really important. Um, and then the, the way at least we envision that is uh, you, you, a developer generates a YAML file, uh, he commits the code into the source code repository. Um, he, we maintain a repository for, infra, as I mentioned, infrastructure, API, and consumer, right? Uh, this will create a PR, and then the approver would go approve it. Uh, uh, so you can have predefined Helm templates uh, for these YAML files, and then that would go into a, uh, I mean, that would go through to a CD tool. Uh, in this case, we have depicted Argo. You can, pick, based on your cloud, you can choose that. So, and then that would go deploy it in Kubernetes and your Kubernetes would go full uh, everything from uh, from the image in maybe JFrog and so on. And then it is getting deployed. Um, one other thing I'd like to call out here is Vault uh, or AWS Secret Manager or depending upon whatever you use, right? Um, your credential certificates and so on or keys should be deployed in uh, Vault. So that is something um, you can retrieve it uh, using like you have something called the uh, uh, vault operator, external secret vault operator, which uh, retrieves data. I mean, two, you can do it in two ways. One as init container where you preload the data, or you can also have a, a sidecar pattern where uh, it constantly checks for any updates and gets the data. So Kong supports all of them. Uh, so you can choose to do it based on your organization's policy. Um, so. Yeah, that is something that we tried to call out. Um, so the same process is also followed for the APIs infrastructure and so on. Um, that is at least from a deployment. Next one is observability and alerting. Um, yeah, something that I'd say is uh, uh, logging is very important. Uh, observability as such is also important because it, it gives you uh, a greater control over your uh, complex systems uh, and allows you to ask questions about why a, why a system behaves, uh, what is wrong, uh, what is causing the latency and so on. So from a logging perspective, we can say that uh, transaction logging and verbose logging, as I mentioned earlier, provides metadata, provides the actual payload. So those are two things that you can do. Um, uh, you can put them on Kibana. I mean, Kong provides its own plugins where you can show it on servers. You have HTTP uh, endpoint that you can give where it provides that and you um, you can send it to Datadog. Uh, there are different options, but that is one of them. Um, and then metrics, it is also another key point where uh, it, you can uh, log all the uh, four golden signals, I would say, uh, for uh, metrics. Uh, maybe you can have latency, uh, the time taken for uh, uh, to serve a request, um, and then the traffic, 
so basically the demand uh, of number of transactions per second error rate uh, where uh, based on different uh, errors like i mean 401 or 500 or you can uh, and then finally you can also have your uh, saturation saturation is more about uh, uh, measuring your um, uh, saturation is about uh, your cpu memory whether that is the, the infrastructure is, has the capability to support your system so that is also something you can have so you kong provides an open telemetry plugin um, so you can get all of them and then also a prometheus plugin where uh, data can be collected into prometheus and then sent to grafana where you can visualize all of these uh, one thing that i suggest is infrastructure metrics should be kept separately api metrics like about each of the apis and consumer based metrics is also something that you want to also think about and finally tracing um this is also uh, zipkin is a plugin that is provided you can choose to write your own as well that you uh, with different span ids uh, apache skywalking plugin is also available in um, th that is something that you can use so different tools can be used because of the plugin infrastructure to uh, uh, do tracing as well finally alerting uh, alerting is the concept where you have a mechanism to alert folks in case there is a huge critical issue right uh, um, you can retrieve uh, these alerting using grafana um you can have uh, go alerts as well which also gets uh, data and alerts or pager duty so these are things that keep to keep in mind for observability alerting and resiliency and uh, finally this probably would show you a um, an art a logical architecture it shows almost all the components that i mentioned uh, starting from the load balancer and then you have kong specifically for authentication monitoring logging acl and so on authentication authorization um and then you have kong operator to manage that kong um and then you have postgres correspondingly for the data store um certificate uh, you have a certificate operator uh, cert manager operator to install certificate inside and then for logging you can have fluentd uh, which kind of gets all the logs and puts it to kibana and finally prometheus to get the metrics i mean whatever i spoke earlier are all encompassed in compost in this logical architecture so let me pass it on to ragu who would go through the deployment architecture and uh, the portal sure thank you sir hi folks uh, i'll be covering the remaining slides here um, the following two slides will talk about how kong as an api gateway can be deployed in kubernetes platform there are multiple variations to this and we have couple, I mean, covered a couple of them majorly used ones here the first setup is about uh, deploying kong api gateway in a separate cluster that will front face the actual uh, back end application cluster here and both cluster needs to be on same network so, so that we can avoid any kind of a, a network latency there uh, one can deploy any number of kong and uh, kong instances in, into the into the cluster if you want to segregate the traffic based on the api products right you can do it, do it and everything can be managed with one single kong operator so advantage with going with this approach right you know you can have a separation of concerns between different teams application teams and gateway teams and each team can maintain the clusters effectively uh, we can enable all the gateway functionalities like at kong layer like caching rate limiting security and the connection from the ap gateway cluster to the application cluster can be done through uh, mutual tls that way the last minute security is protected here so as far as the traffic flow goes here right uh, the back end application cluster will act as a one uh, service mesh composed of multiple microservices and deployed in various name spaces so any interactions between them happens through a steward grace within the cluster boundary uh, which takes care of uh, or back service discovery and other security features that being said any transactions won't cross the boundary and it won't go through the api gateway everything will remain within the application cluster there and only those transactions that comes from external applications mobile apps web traffic and saas applications right only those goes I mean, go through the api gateway and call the respective backend services through its ingress so here kong will act uh, provide all the security layer uh, rate limiting with for the um, and consumer transactions and route the uh, i mean authorized transactions to the respective backend services Again, all the interactions between Kong and the app cluster will be like encrypted through mutual TLS. And this is one of the widely used uh, pattern uh, and it is more effective as well. So going on to the next setup, right? Here we deploy Kong API gateway close to the application workloads on the same cluster. So here Kong API gateway can be issue injected so that it can have an Envoy SSI core proxy inside the Kong. And uh, we can also have a Kuber, I mean, Kong inverse control to, I mean, um, controller to replace the issue inverse controller. Here, Kong will be like an entry point for the service mesh, and all the interactions within the microservices will be through the uh, mutual TLS. Um, the advantage with this, with this approach is gateway will be closer to the workloads, that thus reduces latency. 
Also, there is no need for a last minute security as the gateway itself within, is within the service mesh. And since Complex is SEO injected, it can do all the network routing, circuit breaking, load balancing, uh, between microservices. And still, we can leverage the Kong's functionalities like security rate limiting that can be applied for all the microservices within the mesh. So any interactions from the uh, external applications, mobile labs with traffic and SaaS applications, right? It will go through Kong gateway. That's the entry point for the service mesh. Still, all the microservices within the mesh, right? It will directly talk uh, talk to each other through Envoy. Only the, only the interactions that comes from outside applications like external applications, right? Only those goes through API gateway as as it is again as it is the entry point for the service mesh. So this is also one of the widely used pattern. So it all depends on the organization's policies and their use case, right? Uh, they can decide on whichever pattern that they want to go with. And next comes uh, the uh, how we can secure GraphQL APIs. So before getting into this uh, deployment approach, right, let's talk about what is GraphQL API, right? <clears throat> so GraphQL APIs are type of APIs uh, that use GraphQL query language to enable clients to request and receive only the data they need from the server. So unlike any traditional uh, REST APIs, right, which often requires uh, multiple requests to be uh, to, to be sent to get the data, GraphQL APIs allows clients to specify the exact data that they want the single request. So what GraphQL API server does is it will interact with various data sources, process the response, and aggregates that, and send it back to the clients. So with GraphQL APIs, clients can avoid any uh, overfetching or underfetching of data, resulting in faster and more efficient data retrieval. So this can also benefit the from the uh, flexibility of GraphQL schema, which allows easy change and extensions without breaking the existing client connections. Nowadays, GraphQL APIs are used in various applications, especially in mobile and web, uh, web app space, right? So in this approach, uh, coming back to the appro uh, deployment approach, so we have a, we have a separate GraphQL cluster sitting behind the API gateway cluster, so that it can extend all the gateway functionalities like security, rate limiting, caching, even the consumer management. So we can also make use of the dev portal part of API gateway to store, I mean, to host all the uh, API, GraphQL APIs in the API catalog so that the consumers can go look at it and subscribe to those GraphQL APIs. So this is, this is one of the widely used pattern, um, but there are uh, even a lot of, I mean, uh, multiple variations to this deployment. Like you can still have GraphQL API close to your application workloads, as well as you can have GraphQL API directly exposed to the client source channels, um, you know, uh, through, through a proper authentication mechanisms. So it, again, it, it all depends on the organization's policies and requirements they have it uh, to you know choose any of the options. Um, so here we'll talk about the consumer first approach, what it means, right? So it means that whenever you initiate any workflow, keeping in mind consumers are the starting point. It, it, basically we have to think from the consumer's perspective. So they are the ones who are going to consume your API, expose some business functionality around it, and you know expose that for the actual customer, right? So any API that the provider creates and uh, register with the API gateway dev portal, right? It will it will become more effective only when there's a consumer to consume that API and build a functionality uh, on top of it. So that is what it means by consumer first approach. So for us to enable that approach, right? So what will happen is we have an API provider who develops the API, publish the API through a staggered definitions on dev, dev portal. And that doesn't mean that that API will be deployed in the API gateway yet. So we will have a consumers log into the portal, browse through the API products, and they discover the API that they want to consume, and then they subscri subscribe the API. So when they click on subscription, so we, we can have some kind of notification uh, sent to the uh, API owner, like uh, there's a consumer who wants to subscribe this API that can, can contain information like the API details, the consumer name, and the TPS they're going to generate, the authentication mechanisms, and so on, right? So this will help. And the API owner know who's the consumer, and they can also validate their system to make sure if they can accommodate the additional additional volume. So once they are fine with that additional volume and that uh, uh, subscription, right, they can approve that subscription. And once they approve the, approve the subscription, that is when we can deploy the API configurations and the consumer configurations into API gateway, and we can apply the security and all, all other gateway features on top of it for that API proxy and expose an endpoint for the consumer. So along with that, we can also share the credentials for the consumer, which they can use it to consume the API. So as you see here, it is all like consumer driven approach. Only if there's a consumer who wants to consume an API, that is when we deploy that API into the API gateway. It means that all the APIs in API gateway will have at least one or more consumers and there won't be any, any APIs which are idle and not being consumed. So this is one of the approach that we thought it would be very helpful. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we will talk about uh, Dev Portal. 
So one of the key feature of VAP gateway, right, is to uh, do a better, better consumer management, like managing the consumers, their applications, the, their credentials, the list of APIs they consume, all those things. And also we would require a platform to host the list of API products that consumers can, you know, browse and uh, consume it. So for this purpose, to enable this functionality, we'll need a, a portal, and that is where this dev portal comes into place. So any get any API gateway products out there in the market will have a, a dev portal packaged with it. Um, but in case if you don't have it right, so for example, like for open source community editions, in that case, we can build our own uh, dev portal serving the same purpose. So here we have tried, um, so, you know, proposed, proposed one of the architecture where we can build our own custom dev portal and follow this consumer first approach. So as you see here, uh, we have uh, built it on Backstage. Uh, Backstage is one of the popular uh, open source platform to build dev portals. It has a, a various components like uh, UI and plugins. So U, UI is like a thin client-side wrapper uh, built around a set of plugins. And you can also register your own custom plugins as well. So plugins are like uh, client-side applications which are built to enable certain functionalities. Again, there are a lot of classifications with plugins as well. So it can have uh, standalone plugins which can run entirely on the browser. And it can we can also have plugins backed with the services uh, like databases which runs within the Backstage cluster. And we can also have plugins uh, backed with uh, third-party services, uh, which can run outside, I mean, outside of backstage cluster. So in this case, right, you can have a plugin with different components, like SSO component, which means that any user who wants to log into this portal gets uh, to gets to do a SSO authentication, and they get the right set of uh, visibility to this portal. And we can also have plugins which, uh, with component which can look for different API swagger definitions from different API providers from various source code management repositories and build the API catalog out of that. So that user, once they log in, they can get to see the list of API products on the portal. And then once they click on, once they browse the API products, if they want to consume any API product, that is when they click on subscription. And as we discussed before, this will initiate the consumer first approach strategy. So it will initiate as part of um, the first step is to initiate the workflow approval to the API owner and they approve, approve the subscription, and then that will that should initiate some kind of a deployment pipeline and deploy the API configurations and the consumer config, configurations into API gateway. So as you see, see here, uh, there is no manual intervention of API gateway team to build any uh, API proxies between consumer and provider. Everything is taken care of by itself. And even in case of uh, you know any updates to the swagger definitions, the same process can do that automatically. So this is one of the setup that we can do for a custom dev portal. And uh, finally, so we have some best practices that we have um, that we have come through uh, when we set up the API gateway on a cloud native platforms. First and foremost is about the um, size of your uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, right way. So Kong by nature is more uh, memory intensive application. It holds everything in its memory and process accordingly, right? So when you try to deploy it on Kubernetes, please make sure you size your cluster in the right way. That uh, meaning that uh, you have a proper number of nodes and uh, right number of CPU and memory allocated for that. That will allow you to you know, allocate proper CPU and memory for all the Kong components like proxy and Kubernetes interest controller and spawning the uh, right number of worker processes to handle all the load. And if you're connecting to any, any data store, you, you, you have to make sure you have a right connection limits, timeouts for uh, those data stores. So sizing all the resources will make sure that your API gateway can handle load more effectively with uh, lesser latency. And next one is about uh, you know securing your Kong admin service. So we have admin service, uh, which is like a management service uh, used at the same time to manage Kong configurations. So it is always advisable to keep it secure. Don't enable like node port or gold balancer and have it as a cluster IP and secure the endpoint with some kind of authentication mechanism like OAuth, so that only the authorized people with the valid token can consume that endpoint. And the other, uh, other point is, uh, um, so if you have a Kong deployment spawning across various net, uh, networks like, like public or private clouds, in that case, uh, um, one of the best practices to have a proper folder structure maintained in your source code management repository that will help in easy, easy maintenance as well as to smoothen the uh, deployment process. And then, um, so Kong by nature is more extensible. Uh, so you can have plugins to extend the, extend the functionality and plugins can be both built in as well as uh, custom built plugins. And you can refer that in at various levels, like at cluster level, service level, and route level, right? So um, 
you know, one of the best practices to have um, cluster plugins built out to have all the default configurations like threat protections, payload size, default authentication, and rate limit at cluster level. So that you know, all the APIs will have those values by uh, by default. You don't have to uh, you know create those things for each and every APIs. So in case if you want to override those values, you can you can still create the plugins and you know refer that at the service level so that it can override the default values. Um, the next one is about uh, storing all the sensitive information into, uh, uh, I mean, secret management store like Azure Corp Vault, so that it will be all secured. For example, like infrastructure credentials, like connecting to database or the upstream token credentials to connecting to various applications. Right? We can have have them stored in some secret management store, and we can retrieve that during the runtime with the Kubernetes secrets, and then we can use that in the application. So that way, everything will be secured and it won't be compromised. You, you can also ask your passwords as per your needs. And last but not least, um, so you can uh, have appropriate data stores uh, configured for your application. For example, you can use Redis for caching and rate limiting, and you can use Postgres for storing the tokens as well as to store all the metadata, right? So that way you make sure uh, all the connections are within the limit as you have prop uh, as you have different data stores for different purposes. And that way your applications will perform uh, in right way. So yeah, these are some of the best practices that we have uh, come through when we um, uh, I mean, developed uh, API Gateway on a cloud native platforms. I think yeah, with this, uh, we are at the end of the session. Um, so yeah, if any questions, please uh, you can ask it. Thank you. Yeah, I see a few questions. I'll probably cover them. The first one is about what plugins are used for API monetization in Kong. How, um, how are developers onboarding handled and developer portal implemented? I think the first part uh, with the monetization perspective, I think we can use the rate limiting plugin, advanced rate limiting, or come up with your own plugin and attach it to the consumers. Kong has the capability to attach it either to the consumers or to, or routes or services or have it as a default plugin. One option would be uh, to attach it to the consumer. But if you do that, every single API that the consumer uses uh, will, uh, I mean, will have the same amount of uh, rate limiting. Uh, like for example, if you have 10 TPS for a particular consumer, all the API, APIs that the consumer uses uh, will have to adhere to that particular TPS. Um, that is one thing that, or you can have uh, something like a quota for consumers and then attach it to that consumer as a plugin. Uh, developer onboarding and uh, developer portal implementation, I think Ramu kind of went through that. Uh, if you have any other questions, um, let us know. I will pause that. So I see some other questions as well, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, the other question, yeah, you want to go, yeah, I'll so, probably go over with this as well. We have Kong Enterprise version. We have a few requirements in our projects. Uh, do we have any way to integrate Kong with the service mesh like Linkerd and how? Um, can we have optometry with Kong without any Zipkin plugin, like end-to-end -end telemetry from that the API, I mean, like Kong API call to the upstream system? So first, to the first question, um, yeah, uh, service mesh, uh, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, the, uh, yeah, even from 2.8 or 3.0, Kong has the capability to uh, inherently uh, uh, have connections with Istio and also Kuma. Kuma is uh, Kong's own mesh platform, and uh, Istio, yes, it can be uh, attached to Istio and then uh, used its capability as well. Um, those are two things that I know that can be done um, from a deployment perspective. Um, and uh, without the Zipkin plugin, um, end-to-end -end telemetry i mean the one thing that uh, on top of my mind that if you have a common trace id across the board uh, of course uh, the uh, agar is a tool uh, that can be used um, which will be uh, helpful for uh, providing the end-to-end -end telemetry and view the spans and so on um, that is something you might want to look at um, and then that would give you the end-to-end -end telemetry. If you have a common trace ID across the board from the source system to Kong to the upstream endpoint. Um, so yeah, that is something that you might want to think as well. 
yeah i will take the next question um, so how resilient should one design the post sql deployment right so the reason why we can have post space along with uh, storing the metadata data, right um, if you want to have a kong act as idp so that, that is one place where we can use post space to store the tokens so as we discussed in this slide state so we can design post space as more resilient i, I mean highly available with uh, having uh, um, uh, master and uh, replicas designed in such a way that um, we can have one master in multiple regions for multiple regions as well as you can also design in a way that you can have uh, multi master as well, as well and i'm uh, um, acting at uh, acting i mean um, i am mean, having those acting independently um so that no, so i think that should uh, uh, that should help here so uh yeah uh maybe yeah maybe you, you can also go ahead with uh, the same question regarding uh postgres you can also choose to uh, go with the dbls mode as well right i mean in case uh, in case you don't have dependencies on database that is also but i mean if if you have tokens then yes you need yeah, if you have sure. idp external idp in place which can provide tokens for your authentication yeah in that case you can go with the dbls mode and have your idp generate the tokens and uh, you interact with IDP for validating the tokens. That way, um, you reduce the dependencies with Postgres. Um, another question: Shouldn't the previous slide in the previous slides log stacks be used for logging rather than uh, Kibana? So Kibana, I mean, I believe uh, uh, is more about viewing that log. That is what we had tried to depict. Uh, in case of log stash, it would probably um give us the uh you you will be able to kind of uh uh it is a data pipeline where uh it will collect the logs transform it if required uh and then send it to a respective store and then kibana uh, will be able to view it from kibana and push it to elastic and then view it through kibana that was the intended idea there um then um, can the consumer first approach be used to deploy an event mesh instead of a synchronous communication so the, the main reason why we mentioned the reason we mentioned about consumer first approach is basically basically for deployment purpose so we the approach is like uh, we used to deploy api proxies into api gateway only we only then only when we have any consumers to consume that api so uh, if there is no conception for the api um, it will be still there on the dev portal for the um, discovery perspective but then we deploy those apis into api gateway when we have a consumers to consume those apis So do you want to add anything there? Uh, no, no, not at this point. Maybe it, yeah, it, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, moving on to the next question. Uh, uh, does Kong have plugins recommendation for implementing OAuth uh, scope based uh, to API? Yeah, I mean, uh, Kong has the uh, OAuth plugin. Uh, which has different grant types like client credentials, authorization code, implicit, and others. And uh, we, they have it has the capability to kind of uh, have scope as well uh, for specific endpoints. Apart from that, you have uh, if you want if you're looking at authorization with respect to endpoints, you have something called ACL plugin as well. Um, that uh, the authentication can be done at the OAuth endpoint, and then authorization can additional authorization can be added using the ACL plugin as well. So if you're looking for that, then those two are something that you might want to have a look at, and then yeah, that it can provide scope based. Is it a good idea to have Kong proxy deploy per namespace? Like we can provide Kong as service to every service in the um, in a namespace. May, may this remove latency? So yeah, I mean it is feasible to have multiple Kong proxies deployed, but uh, it, it is always advisable to have one single Kong proxy which can you know um, proxy any number of services. 
to the backend applications, right? If you, if you want to segregate the traffic for different API products, then yes, you can have a different uh, proxy instance deployed and each can take its own traffic. Uh, but again, it depends on the requirements and uh, the needs that you have, the use case that you want to um, um, build, right? So that will determine whether you want to have a separate uh, Kong proxy instance to, uh, you know, proxy those traffic or uh, how it is. Yeah, I mean, so so yeah, as Raghu mentioned, you have you can do that, but uh, Kong has a high throughput. It, it's really capable of handling high traffic. Um, so it's if you want to do that specifically with a specific namespace, that is an overhead that you want to choose to do based on your requirements. So how critical that API is. Uh, but in general, as Raghu mentioned, product-based gateways, I understand. But uh, for each namespace, I don't know how your con config namespaces. So it also depends upon that. But the capability, yes, you can do, but it would be an additional overhead. Right. So even though if you have multiple Kong proxy running, I mean Kong proxy running, you, you can still have one single Kong operator managing all those namespaces. Even that is also possible. Um, yeah, next question. What level of authentication and authorization supported? Uh, I'm a little confused on that. I mean, you have, oh, there are multiple security plugins in Kong plugin hub, and you can choose to build security plugins as well, like uh, the last mile security and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, may, might want to check the plugin hub. What two is supported? Is also supported? Basic auth is supported? API key verification is supported. Those Open are ID few connect. things. Yeah. Open ID connect is also kind of supported. Those are few things that come into my mind. But uh, yeah, have a look at the plugin hub. Mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, you have a uh, Kong plugin PDK where you can create your own plugins as well. I think we kind of answered most of the questions, uh, unless there are any other. I think there is a couple in the chat function. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Does Kong allow customers to continue using and integrate their existing API gateways? For example, if we have uh, something set up in AWS or would Kong gateway specific to gateway need to be stood up? <laughs> So at the end of the day, I believe it. all of them are like HTTP endpoints if required, you can connect them to Kong. But uh, I do not know of any inherent, like a thing that would kind of let you migrate or connect it directly, at least I'm not aware of that. Um, but you can effectively, if you want to go through multiple hops and take a hit on latency, you can effectively, it's going to be a HTTP endpoint at the end of the day where you can connect from one endpoint to the other and then connect to your upstream using Kong and face out your original gateway slowly using GTMs and LTMs. Um, I, I'm assuming I answered your question, but if not, let me know. So the other one that I see is can Kong support multi-cloud cluster ingress? Yes, um, I'm not wrong. There is a gateway resource uh, that has come up uh, in, in Kubernetes. Um, so that would help in multi, I know multi-cluster, multi-cloud, I have to check. I think that's supposed to multi-cloud as well. I need to check that. You might want to check at uh, gateway resource in Kubernetes. Uh, Raghu, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think even we have to check that. All right, I think those are the questions. Yeah. I'd like to thank Talia. It was fun talking yeah. to folks and answering different questions. Thank you for this. Yeah, thank you. Up. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and for answering the questions. It was great. Let's see if we have any last ones coming in before we wrap it up. 
And a few of you asked if this will be recorded. Yes, I posted the link here in the chat. It will be um, posted either later today or tomorrow at our YouTube channel. So you can find all of our recordings from our previous events there. So thank you so much to our Kong champions for presenting. It was a pleasure having you here. And thanks so much for everyone who joined. And I'll see you at our next Tech Talk. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.